Hello and welcome to the Chacha Wakabada Bassett Creek Oral History Podcast, where our guests discuss ways that they and other indigenous peoples have lived, worked, and played in the Chacha Wakabada watershed for thousands of years. This project was created in Minnesota Makoche, or Minnesota, the traditional and contemporary homelands of the Dakota people. The project was co-led by Dr. Casey Keeler and Crystal Boyd with support from community partners. More information is included at the end of this episode. On behalf of everyone who contributed to this project, thank you for tuning in. Good afternoon, I'm here with Jim Rock um, for the Bassett Creek Oral History Project. So how many talk you? I said hello my relatives, I'm Wambadi Hayetu, part of my name. Ocheti Shakhoing Oyate Hematha Imanijaska Imachage. Hello my relatives, I'm of the seven Starfire Nations. Um, I said I was born at Imanijaska, that's St. Paul. Um, my Ate dad was uh, Sisito on Dakota. He went back to the stars about uh, 11 years ago. So I wish you could have been hearing this from him. Um, it's a joyful, beautiful um, new responsibility to try and, you know, his moccasins. And he always walked with love. He was a wonderful ambassador. Um, he uh, modeled our values so well. and. And uh, so anyway, he uh, is in large part why Roxanne and I are together. So that's why I need to mention uh, he was one of the very few elders that Roxanne hadn't met yet around here in the Twin Cities. Uh, we were both at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. So uh, let's see, did I say anything else I didn't translate there? I guess it's a stopping place just to... Intro. <laughs> well, thank you for that. That was such a um, a generous introduction and such a, a nice tribute to your dad as well. So you mentioned that you were born in St. Paul, um, but for how long and have you lived in this area surrounding Bassett Creek? Oh yeah. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. Uh, most St. Paul people don't cross the river to the Minneapolis side, and vice versa. We get very loyal uh, over generations um if that's a minnesota thing or uh, probably even more so indigenous um we we do love the places we're a part of we invest in those relationships we want to see the health of of all our relatives that's why when we greet hello my relatives we're i'm seeing the rooted the, the ones that still have green out there and the ones who had little buds ready to poke out and the wingeds, the crawling, swimming, all the relatives. And um, so those healthy relationships are, are key. And I think that's what maybe in some ways we put down roots. And um, I've kind of learned that I need to be more flexible. <laughs> and if... Uh, anyway, so after um, university, uh, my first work was up at the White Earth Reservation. So I went, you know, four and a half hours north. And then when I came back down, it happened to be on this side of the river. <laughs> so um, I still have, you know, family, friends, long, you know, uh, I'm on projects of sacred site and wetland restoration. And I work with archaeologists and universities and so forth on both sides of the the big river, the Hahawakpadam, or Hahawakpa, <laughs> yeah, we're at Bassett Creek, Hahawakpadam. The Dam makes it like creek instead of river, Wakpa, Wakpadam. Yeah, so my dad was, um, he um, didn't really use much English till about age 12. He was a first language speaker, and um, he was his, his kunshi, his grandma's um, assistant. For those 12 years, she was a Wachbewina, a leaf woman, an herbalist, and a doula um, midwife. 
Um, so he would follow her all over and with her bundles and, and you know, putting tobacco and, and, and bringing back the different um, food, food plants and medicine plants and preparing them. And, and she had her bundles, he said, um, over by where her bed roll was. And um, so at age 12, he went off to boarding school. Um, Roxanne and I both have, uh, you know, uh, Indian dad and, and non-Indian mom who, uh, you know, it's, uh, because I grew up in St. Paul, I think it was a window of time where our, our experiences were very different as I compare Roxanne, uh, being, uh, a native woman in South Dakota where Indians and rattlesnakes were often compared, uh, where she says in the library, there might've only been three, two, three, four books on us. And yet I, I feel maybe, maybe, I don't know. It's, it's hard to answer these questions because you could almost give any answer. It's what do I want to focus on? I can't, you know, Sure, there were times of uh, where you feel bad, but also times where we would find our colleagues, you know, in the elementary school, you know, I'd sit in the back row with uh, the ho chunks or uh, uh, the kids who spoke Spanish, or um, we had uh, melanin and, and diversity um, in the in the sixties, um, and and it was a time the country was had its growing pains and there were things that I didn't realize about my ate, my dad, that he didn't tell me till about six months before he passed because he knew I'd probably brag him up and he was so humble. He, uh, so I think it's important to share though, for this project that, you know, he was always kind of behind the scenes leader, advocate, bridge. He didn't want to be out front. He barely let us take pictures. He didn't want recordings. This this made him uncomfortable. So, part of me, you know, Roxanne and I are, we're, we have to be used to it. But there's a piece of me that I I just like him too. It's uh, I have to pretend I'm not being taped. Um, so then he was with uh, Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King and uh, Ralph Abernathy and Dick Gregory in Milwaukee um, multiple occasions uh, for uh, in the early 60s, uh, like I think it was a 61 and 63 March, one was with uh, elder housing and one was uh, sanitation workers. And, and so that very early Rainbow Coalition, I'm not sure they even called him that, you know, but he was tall and um, for part of his time he was... Uh, grinding cocoa beans, cacao, making chocolate uh, in Milwaukee after Korea. He was, so at the boarding school, uh, at Flandro, they told him never use that language again. And, you know, basically those boarding schools would give you a fourth grade education at best and usually just some service skills if it was horseshoeing or welding or carpentry. But he loved all of that. He, he had, you know, many, many skills. He just never got the degrees for it. Uh, I saw other, other people taking, you know, even, even engineers and so forth, um, taking his ideas. And uh, he was always coming up with improvements and so forth. So uh, it was one of the last road trips we got to make was go back over there. And he showed me uh, where, where that chocolate factory was, you know. And, but he also had um, 37 years of sobriety. And that's why I can be here. Um, again, it's the same for Roxanne and I both that, um, <clears throat> it's, uh, we are here because others made hard choices for love and sanity and health and, uh, and they matured, um, but it wasn't always like that. So, um, I think you know, you feel that you want to give back for our, our children, grandchildren, and um, 
and make this a better place. And uh, so, yeah, the um, uh, uh, cousins over in Wisconsin and so forth, too. So does Roxanne in, in Milwaukee. There were so many pieces we didn't realize how much we, we knew. And that's, uh, you know, he could see things. Both of us were kind of the nerdy academics who just wanted to focus. We didn't have, you know, we kept our boundaries. And it was, uh, I was teaching uh, for American Indian Summer um, STEM program. Um, it was about 17 years uh, with a Ho-Chunk, uh, wonderful brother, um, and uh, so he he's a mathematical musician, and I'm a you know the scientist, language, uh, whatever culture. We together we put this curriculum together, and then um, but it was always soft funded, and um, and uh, different directors and so forth. Then Roxanne came to be that director, and she saw how we were just doing it anyway, and and uh, she liked how we did that, so. Uh, uh, let's see. <laughs> I better quit for a second. No, I feel like you have um, touched on my next few okay. questions. All right. But what really stood out for me in hearing you speak, Jim, was um, you grew up in St. Paul, but you mentioned you know the Mississippi River, spending mm -hmm. time up on oh, White yeah. Earth, and now you came back to the city, yeah. so you're on the other side of the river. But the significance of the water, watersheds, Definitely. rivers for Native people. Um, what is your dad's name? Yeah. Um, his uh, his Washicha name is interesting uh, because he was his dad had a very rare experience. You know, a lot of times at boarding school they would give us names, so they have a lot of Wilson, Larson, Johnson, Olson, Nelson. White names. Yeah, <laughs> and well, his he said that his dad had a piece of paper, and they got to the point where he needed uh, a name. So he went up to some farmhouse and he said, you know, like, like a census taker. He's like, what's your name? You know, can you write your name for me? Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know if the person knew that that would then become the name. It was Wilson. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of us have returned to traditional names of our grandparents, uh, our great grandparents or through ceremony. And um, yeah, so it's. It's been wonderful that, uh, I, I'm glad you reminded me that, yeah, because up at White Earth, at Wabit, that's Ojibwe for, you know, sunrise, Algonquin language, the east direction, mm -hmm. and uh, much like Roxanne's name, Badabinikwe. Um, but then um, I want to, you know, I ended up coming back to the Twin Cities for graduate work, and, and uh, but I was recruited. Um, I was teaching chemistry and physics up, up there for a couple, three years, and uh, I was recruited by an African-American woman superintendent in uh, all places. Uh, it's hard to say it. <laughs> Why is that? A, it's Waziata. Waziata. And I thought, oh, okay, this is changing my stereotype because growing up in the cities, you hear about the Minnetonka, Edina, and Waziata. <clears throat> Waziata. And, and of course, being from, you know, Lower East Side or whatever, uh, we didn't have that kind of financial. Uh, I mean, in terms of state hockey tournaments or all those rivalries, right? It's, it might as well have been Beverly Hills or something. <laughs> I didn't know. So it was, uh, I thought, wow, there's diversity here. Maybe, maybe I can work. So I ended up, I guess that's what I was trying to say, and I probably stayed too long because... I could bring in a lot of other Dakota speakers, uncles and aunties and so forth, but I was always in trouble for telling them that their real name is Waziata. And when you spell that name Waziata, I said, that's not English and it's not Dakota. It's not in English dictionaries nor Dakota dictionaries. Why? Because I'm not trying to poke their finger here. I'm just saying it's misspelled, mispronounced, misheard. It's a problem. Can we deal with truth? No, we could not. <laughs> and and so that white privilege was very much, um, as as time went on, it became even greater and greater. My student, I had wonderful students that I loved and mm -hmm. 
but they love me. And there were always a few, though. And some of them had well-known corporate last names. Um, and I know my history here. Mm-hmm. I know the railroad builders and the flour mill operators, mm-hmm. the lumber barons, the the real names of the places. And uh, as long as I didn't peel that back and start teaching truth, <laughs> keep it to the technology, you know. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 this is so important, Jim. You know what? This isn't any of the questions, but you know, you worked in the K through 12 system mm-hmm. in the West Metro, where particular pockets are known for their white affluence. Yeah. And what does that mean as a Native person working in this environment, but also this historical legacy of the lumber, the flour, um, the railroad industries in this region? Also, has me thinking a lot of the work of Louise Erdrich, who's written about this in her fiction. Yeah. Um, but a lot of these families are still around. Exactly. Um, and then today we also have a, a fair number of Fortune 500 companies in the West Metro as well attending these schools at particular um, the places. The, you know, Blake so and then, yeah. in, in these schools that you were teaching in, did you ever have Native students? Oh, yeah. That's what's so amazing. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm concerned about naming names too much here because... Uh, it's like my dad, you know, you could easily name drop and people would, or even if I hint at it, you can figure it out. But um, there were some wonderful people who then grew up, if I knew them from 14 to 18 years old, and then they would be on mom or dad's board. And so now we're one or two generations where they have an ethical conscience. They look at the world differently, but... Um, in, in Minnesota, in education particularly, this is a time where this phrase, CRT, critical race theory, is so, they, they throw that term around. Mm-hmm. Well, of course, people like, like us, like Roxanne and myself, yourself, our, our view, our worldview is different. And it's a very good different. It's a very healthy, wonderful perspective. But how rare to have someone like you in every way ask those questions and and peel that back because most of the time you're sharing it on ears that just don't want to hear what's really behind it. And it's really hard to put into words because they're just so loaded with thought and heart, mind and you know feeling. So um, when I think back to the patience my dad had, like one time we were, we did a lot of father-son stuff. So over at corporate headquarters at 3M once, you know, because I was trained in chemistry, chemical engineering, astronomy and physics, all that nerdy stuff. I was two years old with glasses. So <laughs> as I think back, why? What, what made me love education? Why did, why did schooling work for Roxanne and I in spite of how most of it was colonial? And it, I think it's that deep curiosity. And you know we're related to these little crawling ones here. It's a circle with my glasses. I could see things <laughs> down in the, you know, and uh, the grass blade or something. And then I also realized, even though I was two or three years old, you know, that when the light went through, um, you could see a little sun and it would get hot. And so you could light leaves on fire. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a pretty powerful tool. We couldn't play with matches, but lenses for uh, microscopes and telescopes. So seeing little stuff and faraway stuff and that cosmology that develops. Mm -hmm. And just because my dad would say, learn everything you can from those books. But remember, there's much more written all around you and within you than in all those books. Mm -hmm. So he didn't discount um, Euro education. And he loved, you know, stories and, you know, he was always reading too. But um, I had a grandmother who played Scrabble with me and so forth. So you learn math and spelling and it's whatever it takes to give kids that positive feeling. And then when I could meet a few other people like Ben Blackhawk or that somehow, you know, but I remember it was an Ojibwe classmate in fourth through seventh grade. Everybody thought he was Japanese and he didn't want him to know, you know, and they'd call him Fuji, for example, or, you know, so yeah, I'm, I could blend. My nose wouldn't let me blend. It's, 
I got more of my mom's skin and my dad's nose. <laughs> so there were times, and again, as long as I, you know, I didn't have long hair, I wasn't um, always, but I, I, as I prepared for this, I have a book from like nine years old from the school and it was old when we had it. But what's so amazing is their short chapters of Minnesota history mm -hmm. with illustrations written in the 30s, and this was in the 50s that we, and so here's a chapter on uh, Jonathan Carver, or, you know, Hill, or uh, all those names that have counties, Ramsey, and right. Sibley, and, and so, you know, I could read the little book, and, and what's amazing is they actually put indigenous perspective in there uh, a little bit. I mean, way more than critical race theory today would mm -hmm ever allow a book like that from 70 years ago to survive on a librarian's shelf. Mm -hmm. I know because there are, there are, the purges are happening. They always were. Mm -hmm. We always had to stand up for a, a broader perspective of, even if they're bad books, at least you can now document how bad it was. There was a $200 bounty on our heads. So my dad's family, his grandparents and parents, uh, great grandparents maybe, I, went over a thousand miles away. They were the furthest of the exiles to go up to Saskatchewan. Um, Dakota White Cap Nation in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, but then they went up to Prince Albert. So this winter I was able to connect with uh, that community as I'm trying to find, uh, if any, and I realized I found some charts from again the 1890s and early aughts that over half of those folks, if they did make it up there or last more than a year or two or three, over half died of TB. And they really didn't get to establish uh, whatever farmsteads or find employment or, you know. It, so a lot then came back to these other places that became, you know, White Cap or Standing Buffalo or whatever. So, um, and so when I think about Wounded Knee and those who were Dakotas in exile who came south because it was tough up there. You know, they were hoping grandmother England, I mean, I think of the Ukrainians going to Poland, you know, mm -hmm. with this little guy who was 10 years old and spent 600 miles on a train with a phone number on his hand. My dad talked about walking, you know, 20 miles with bad shoes, if any, and mm -hmm. bloody feet. And he wasn't on that, but other, you know, it's, we are still in exile here. 90% of us no longer live in our home state, in this entire state, Mani Sota Makoche, for 10,000 plus years. Right. Um, we were here before the glaciers and we came back, that mountain of ice. And um, so when you, when you know the stories, and my dad's grandma would share those all through the winter, and... Uh, the stars, that's, that's how, what I'm getting at is mm -hmm. the star stories and, and, and figures up there are the best mnemonics for layering multiple, um, like teepee poles, mm -hmm. you know, one teepee pole is good, but a whole bunch lean together and tied together where think of each pole pointing to different stars. Mm -hmm. And now you've got this structure to live in and it's a, a philosophical structure too. I, I call it star architecture, <laughs> and that's the Makoche project too. Is because we do want to return to those traditional uh, ways of living, the Wichohang, and to uh, use our language. You know, my dad. Uh, many years he was. He wasn't back here after he was wounded in Korea and recouped, and. Uh, and then when the urban environment and stuff, so you you know, if some of his friends came around, but uh, again, some of his friends, boarding school, then they lost the language. He still was able to retain. Uh, but uh, I, I wish I had uh, learned more earlier, uh, sooner. But um, it's uh, the name of the stars. I'm just so grateful because that's um, and and his grandma. You know, it, there's birthing connection to that. That's why in the Big Dipper, for example, there's a, a blue woman, a ton or tun, depends if you say it, tuni, uh, auntie, 
blue auntie birth woman could be translated and she's the celestial midwife that helps the baby to be born um, and if the mother is hanging on to the TV rope and the contractions and you've got other grandmas or aunties holding that uh, mom to be uh, to try to keep that joyful and and uh, and so it's this cosmic umbilical cord mm -hmm. so we have this pouch whether it's a turtle pouch or a, a salamander pouch for a girl or boy and so there's the Milky Way and there's I mean these are the things that you could just go on and on explaining all that and uh, so Jim you spoke a little bit about the significance of place for you and Dakota people living in exile for so long and you're here in, in Golden Valley, um, what really is a homeland for Dakota people. So when you think of the Bassett Creek area, um, how do you relate to this region as a Native person? I feel the ancestors very directly on this exact piece of property. We have the chart, the maps, starting in the 1874 and then to the late 1950s and redone 1960s that show the Dakota trail system from uh, Medicine Lake to the Mississippi. So we're about midway, about eight miles from the river here. And it went right through what is considered our property now, but we have five neighbors behind here, um, boundaries and, you know, electric wires and fencing and all that. but. That's where um, my dad first felt a very good connection when, he, when we were looking at possibly buying this house and it wasn't like the crazy times now. You actually had a couple of days to <laughs> try it out, look at it, think about it. He goes, hmm, good Indian house. <laughs> he goes, hmm. And, uh, and we looked back there and he, and he did feel something. And, well, then later we found out that the path was to it. I put, you see, he was named for the buffalo, the star buffalo. Don't stand in front of the star buffalo. It's kind of, well, yeah, you can't because you stand below. That's, mm -hmm. And uh, the buffalo skull that I placed out there where he stood to name my granddaughter um, a few months after she was born, give her her Dakota name. Um, that's where, again, he... In the physical human form models that we are buffalo people and the name that he gave our granddaughter right there I mean you see these are real relationships the soil still holds our our blood our bones our remains it should even if the asphalt and concrete and infrastructure has I know it's there I know there's a, in a spirit form we call kapemini that what's above is below. There's a spiritual existence and a physical existence. The spiritual one is way longer. Mm -hmm. We're just in these uh, bodies for a while. Atoms are made in stars. So star stuff are us. And we say that. We mean it. We come from the stars and to the stars we return. We come from the earth to the earth we return. So we're supposed to be really good relatives, always thinking in these thousands and thousands and thousands of years since the big ice was here. And... Uh, so I feel it directly. And the flowing water, that's energy. That's her blood, the Earth Mother. So when Roxanne and I walk around, we walk a lot. Uh, we get approximately, uh, we try our 10,000 steps a day here. The, the creek is uh, not very accessible because it's on private lands. And there's two golf courses. But I've taken pictures and superimposed the views onto that map mm -hmm. that shows what it should be. And uh, unfortunately, as Roxanne told you too, the number of trees, I mean, we had a couple of blowdown events and then with some tree disease, but it seems to be these companies, Asplund and others that are, they're predatory. They, Roxanne had got into a big fight with one of these guys. And we, we both have because they insist on cutting, coming onto your property and, and well, you know, well, look at these power lines. The poles are leaning. They won't repair the, for 15 years, we've been fighting with them. It's like, hey, straighten it up. You don't want to, you know. And you go, well, that just carries the cable, that one 
line that's so low right there and the squirrels run on it, you know. So I guess it doesn't have power. Okay, but they won't straighten it up. The power is the upper one. And our neighbors have taken out so many trees. And the, there was probably an oak that was well over 100, maybe 120 years here. That's our grandparents. Mm -hmm. You know, we become part of the trees. Maybe there wasn't a burial, but maybe there was. We go, the, the atoms don't go away. They just go around and around and around. We're recycled stardust here. So these Dakota place names, we mean it. My dad does first language. Um, it's our philosophy to live in a good way as relatives and leave it better than you found it. I mean, and I don't see that happening. Uh, people have such a short-term view and they just want to flip houses and make a profit and they're not here to stay. Yeah, I appreciate this. And this is something also Roxanne touched on is the temporality of place yeah. for a lot of And folks. individuality, temporality, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. But for Native people and the Dakota people here that it's deeper than that. You know, you, you can't just pick up and move your house. And these, these places hold deep, deep meaning um, and real sign cultural significance. And then the property taxes that, you know, we're trying to retire. We don't know if we could keep paying the property taxes even if the house is paid off. We're taxed to live on the land of our ancestors right. illegally because the law is still on the books that in 1862, it was a $200 bounty, as I said previously, my dad's family had to go up to Canada. A few of them came back, only 10% now are here. That's why this project is so important. So we are buying land back with the help of settler uh, allies who uh, recognize it's like back rent for colonizers. And, and it, it really, there's a lot of wonderful church groups and, and our Makoche Tikupi website to share about that. So a lot of, uh, Roxanne and I are in the governing council. Um, I do presentations about these kinds of things. People want to know what they can do. Well, there's a lot we can do. And, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of churches have land. And there's even some big corporations. And again, we're in the middle of trying to, it, it's very tricky because right. those gatekeepers, uh, they have uh, freedom from taxation if they mm -hmm. hang on to that land, but then they don't want us to, we're not gonna build casinos. We're not trying to take property out of, you know, I mean, it's where our ancestors are buried. We, we know that in some of these cases, we're trying to get some of that land back, but it works against us if we say too much because then the grave robbers and the looters, the hunters, the mm -hmm. pot diggers, I can't say a lot of what I know. I work with the Science Museum, Indigenous Roundtable, with you know people like said Darlene St. Clair and others, and uh, we know specific places mm -hmm. that when when they cleared out the Pennsylvania woods over there, we used to walk in those paths and feel again, and but they won't leave any shrubbery or, or underbrush or they they think they have to clean it all up. And they're taking habitat away. So we used to hear the frogs were deafening here. It was incredible. Uh, just 15 years ago. Yeah. This has me thinking um, about exile and access to land. So, and of course, after the U.S. Dakota War, Dakota people were in exile. Um, some have never been able to, re to return. But in other cases, Dakota people have been able to. But now there's a conundrum where Dakota people can't access land. Um, because of the high cost of land. Oh, so we have Dakota people who are both experiencing houselessness yeah. um, or the inability to purchase a home to live in even if they do have the financial means. Um, and we increasingly see that in the West Metro suburbs exactly. because of the cost of living here. Um, if you want to speak on that. Well, it's interesting that the yellow, green, blue, and red coloring on the maps up north here and the, the North Jim Crow version and they called it redlining um, to keep those of the slums or for the brown folks, black and brown. In, in this case, since 1862, we've had redlining from red people. Um, and it's still very much in place. And if a place like Waziata or Chaske or Chahasampaha, Anokite or Matombede, Bede Mato, or all these place names are Dakota names. It's not just Bede Makaska, and everybody threw a fit, and we got one place changed back, and I'm so grateful to our uh, our twin nieces and uh, 
you know, um, Cloud Man Village. They're, they're honoring their ancestor, and uh, yeah, we know them. They, you know, Dad doesn't live too far from here too. So, um, it it just feels like we're gonna keep pushing, and I hope we can do it gently, and out of people's hearts, because you can't legislate an act of the heart. Then it's begrudging. People don't act out of love and recognizing what's right. What does justice look like? Mm -hmm. Now that question was the title of Dr. Wazia Tolini's book, 2008, What Does Justice Look Like? And her vision was that we should be able to come home. And so to buy back these pieces of land and build earth lodges, and um, I got pictures of what those look like here too, but you've been very generous with your time. Um, I'm glad that you are talking about place names a little bit. And for me, I just, hearing you speak again, it's um, drawing comparisons between the pushback against native space mascots. Mm -hmm. And gradually people have turned the corner and realizing that, yes, it is the right thing to do to get rid of those. Um, They're very derogatory and offensive. Um, I know a lot of place names that have been um, native place names that have been replaced over time by English or white place names. Maybe we'll see the kind of same yeah. shift in place. That would be I something so. <laughs> encouraging to think of. Yeah. But Haha ha Waxdan, yeah. of course, is the Dakota name for Bassett Creek. So what do you think about the role and importance of language and place names, especially in these really white settler places? Yeah. I mean, even having dual signage, uh, Roxanne's been working, we both are professors at UMD, so on the big lake and all the creeks and walkways up there, they're very open to having uh, Ojibwe and Moline language in, in English. Now, what I'm saying is, without sounding too controversial, Ojibwe up there for 400, maybe a little more years, but we, we say we've always been here. Mm-hmm. Uh, they say we come from a star or we come from a cave or we've always been here. And those are the three axiomatic principles, uh, the three tiki poles, that uh, the stars above match to like a cave below, and it, it's it's a capemini. So it's very important for us to know these things, and it would reinforce that if we could have dual signs. I mean, we have all kind of languages here now. Mm-hmm. You know, when we were trying to start our uh, Dakota and Ojibwe dual language immersion, the Department of Education, we, we unfortunately had to fight for seven years. A whole bunch of us with PhDs sit around the table. And yet, authorizers would have the Russian immersion or Korean immersion or Hmong immersion, Somali immersion. But the first language, Dakota, yeah, Yapi here. Oh, they, they said, well, you're just going to bang on a drum. And come on, are you really going to teach calculus? Are you? Yes, you know, you could see that the technology I've shown you when the tape wasn't running here because some of this can't be recorded, it needs to be taught live, and some of the work I do is in a planetarium, but I don't make prepackaged shows Mm -hmm. because it needs to be taught viva voce in Latin, right? A living breath. Yeah, and a lot of these teachings also need to be taught outside. Mm -hmm. That's right, interactive. In places, on the land. That's it, active learning. Yeah, experiential learning. That's what we wanted for our school. Because kids remember it, it becomes, it's wired into them then, you know. So they're having food and music and dance and it's part of that kinesthetic body memory and, yeah. So keeping this conversation going with a focus on the land and the recognition of Dakota people here, past and present, this oral history project grew out of the VCTP land acknowledgement process. So what do you think about land acknowledgement statements, broadly speaking? And after the work has been done to create a responsible and respectful land acknowledgement, what do you see as necessary follow-up and supplemental work to be done? Great question. Thank you from my heart. Because land acknowledgements have kind of become popular and it's, it's an easy first step, even though people might spend years debating over the therefores and the, you know, the word from the dictionary they're going to use, but again, um, it's land back, and not just land back, water back, access to that water, and healthy water, and it's not just a human anthropocentric perspective, but I see these ducks, and that should have 
healthy access and there's all these wetlands around here are so over managed and sprayed and what people think is a, a scrub plant or they're not following the cycles a uh, very dear good friend of mine is a wildlife biologist he was a national park uh, service photographer and he's a golden god resident and he knew my dad and my dad showed him how to offer tobacco and get the better pictures <laughs> that you just wouldn't believe and but if you have the right attitude and you put out some tobacco those relatives might actually come to you I mean, a bird might actually land on you, and a very rare one at that, or we know this is real. These things happen, but um, it won't happen if we aren't walking in the right way. Allow the mystery to happen. See and feel and smell and be in the sacred, even if that person didn't clean up what their dog left behind. It is disgusting. It's disturbing because when I take people to the burial mounds, which are actually birth pregnant mother belly mounds, it's not just a place of death, but birth over in St. Paul, where I was born at those mounds and above the cave with the drawings in there. Um, now there are, are needles, there's houseless folks in desperation. There's violence. Uh, St. Paul, I think, had 30... No, 13 shootings in the first 90 days here. Um, I love that place dearly. And even though I've been assaulted and, and um, we, we fought, you know, 40 of my 60-some years to try to say this is not a park. This isn't for your dog or a, a splash pool for, a, seriously, all these weird ideas that they want to do. This is a cemetery for our ancestors who are here. Only six mounds of what should have been 18 are still there mm -hmm. on the upper part. And the lower part should have been 19 mounds above the cave. Zero of those are left. So six out of 37 mounds remain. Uh, from those places, I could do the alignment of astronomy and the mathematics and show that it's a pattern, it's a grid that is extensive across Turtle Island. Mm -hmm. Our ancestors, multiple thousands of years ago, left for us and and but honestly i found in the document uh in saint paul and historical society and other places that they were bulldozed quote unquote for a better view mm -hmm. the realtors came in and and of course they wanted to drain the swamp the jj hill to build the railroad and he dynamited the cave that actually had the drawings in it where many tribes would study those drawings that's what i do is archaeo and ethnoastronomy and we study how it's encoded in what look like symbols and just because the Western system can't feel it, read it, and know it, mm -hmm. I could translate that. It's taken me a whole life, and I don't want to just put this out there in, in little pieces. It's going to take a long time for people to study it and learn it. That's why it's a part of what I've been publishing carefully, and uh, there's a high school out in Stillwater, and there's, you know, I taught for the Tribal College of Fond du Lac, or... Uh, you know, Augsburg, we had American Indian uh, philosophy and spirituality and, and astronomy and all that mixed together. Mm -hmm. So there are appropriate places, but uh, the best place I think Roxanne and I agree that we ever taught was at our tribal college. We had a, Fond du Lac had a Twin Cities office here until about 2007, uh, eight, something like that. And to have 100 students from about 80 different Native nations all living in this urban place. And we all taught each other. So we would share our star stories, you know. So then we, we all have a wealth of, we're like spokes in the wheel. Yeah. Yeah, so hearing you speak uh, on land acknowledgement, you know, it really draws the attention to place, right? We're here in Golden Valley on the Bassett Creek watershed, but this is only a small spoke of a larger network sure. and the responsibility, um, both at the individual level and the collective responsibility exactly. from that we should have to place. So what advice would you like to give to those who help manage and steward the Haha ha um, watershed and surrounding mm -hmm. area today? I hope they're open-hearted as well as open-minded and I hope they've studied. I think uh, sometimes people need jobs and they just put in their time and they overdo things and they don't even need to be done. 
I, I really hope they'll listen to the experts. The knowledge is there um, of what we should not be doing. And um, I hear excuses mostly when we confront them that, um, well, you know, this needed that and we can't go to that, blah, 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 blah. you know, and you know, Roxanne and I are only two voices and you know, there's other, I mean, the, who stands up for the relatives? This the also, green growing, they're, they're, who's their advocates? Right, this also has me thinking, um, you know, they need to study, Yes. but it's study what? What sort of knowledge systems hold value in Indigenous different places? protocol too. Right, sure. so, you know, different management techniques, Western management techniques yeah. are often in contrast to in, traditional indigenous knowledges. So Thank that you. matters as well in terms of what people are doing. Um, so one of the final questions I have is what would you like future generations to know about your experiences as a native person living in a predominantly white environment? Life is um, it's a gift. It's a privilege. One day at a time. My dad, uh, he had uh, he'd been on the other side at least twice or three times that we know of, you know, pronounced and come back. And um, so he um, he reminded us that I'm just grateful that we were here. I had you know six plus decades. That's a long time. That means I've consumed a lot of material and, and water and food and the total footprint, carbon and otherwise, um, I could never give that back. That's why to live more sustainably, uh, I, I feel I've been selfish. Yeah, and um, I don't know. I just, uh, I would hope for future generations, we choi chake, we say generation, is that we, we have not been good stewards to leave them uh, better than we found it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, it's kind of with shame and broken heart that um, there's not as wealth of uh, healthy, you know, um, what they should have and be inheriting. So our human supremacy has really been, uh, it's, it's about our ego. And um, I, I often explain that, you know, we can't help but be egocentric when we're born. Babies have a lot of needs, and yet they're also Wakan. Uh, they come in from the star world, fresh and clean and wonderful, and and then over time we can become uh, not just egocentric, but ethnocentric, unless we have multiple cultures, and and uh, and then we can become geocentric, and that it's just one world is. But then heliocentric, you know, we think the earth is a center, but then we find out, oh, maybe it's that sun. No, the sun is just one of all these 300, you know, billion stars in, in one galaxy. We could become galactocentric. And now we realize only 100 years ago that there are other galaxies out there. So it's a very large cosmic worldview that I've been able to uh, learn about. And I think our ancestors always thought of that. When we had numberless numbers of buffalo, my great grandpa was able to pick up the dried buffalo chips. They didn't have a smell. That's a fuel source. They ate the prairie and grasses. And, and then, so those were good for, you know, um, there should be this intact prairie system here. 98% of the, the wetlands are, are gone. 99.95% um, 99 of Dakotas are, are gone. The whole Minnesota Makote, um, only one percent of the tall grass prairie is left. Mm -hmm. There's a little patch about a mile south of Highway 212 on the way out to Pejuta ZZ and Chantayapi. Um, I would love to see those prairies come back, so the buffalo can come back. Those Keystone uh, relatives. Again, it's kind of using a Western name, but when a few relatives come back, a few more can, and the numbers. You know, they deserve their place back mm -hmm. too. And um, 60 million bison came down to about 300 in 1879 when my great grandpa was born. Same year as the light bulb, same year as Einstein. And 
that's the other thing, light pollution. If we don't realize this fear of each other in our humanity, we're not good relatives. And so we keep trying to build brighter and bigger, more polluting, energy sucking lights on parking lots and so forth. And I work with dark skies and the international dark skies, and we still have some of the best dark skies up north. Uh, but that North Shore is, we're working hard up there too, Star Skies Duluth, to change the lights. I would love to see uh, the local municipalities and businesses understand that it affects the migrations of the birds and the turtles and the, even the fireflies. No wonder we don't have all the insects we used to. The fireflies can't find each other to mate because of the lights and the flashing. So there's so many interrelationships that light is a pollution. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't know the star constellations, because we can only see maybe 20 or 30 stars of what should be 3,000 to 6,000 stars, of course we're not going to know the stories. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of a long answer for what I hope for the future, that the skies get darker, that the land gets more healthy, and the relatives come back. So what I have taken <laughs> is that the land acknowledgement and place is so significant but we need to think about it in terms of doing the right thing and access the place and the watershed beyond humans mm -hmm. for all relatives and for all species. And this is a good reminder for me too, as a native person, you know, I have tended to focus so much on history and human presence, um, but to continuously think about all, all, re all relations here. Right, so sure. thank you so much, Jim, for your time yeah. today. Obi de Tonka and Chi Miigwech, and I look forward to uh, getting to know our other indigenous neighbors and relatives right here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. This project may serve as a model for other communities that seek to go beyond land acknowledgement. To learn more about this oral history project, please contact Hennepin History Museum. The project was produced following the standards and principles of the Oral History Association. In addition to this podcast, the interview recordings, transcripts, and narrator files included signed legal released agreements can be found at the Hennepin History Museum. Funding and other support was provided by the St. Anthony's Falls Heritage Board, Hennepin History Museum, Valley Community Presbyterian Church, and the University of Wisconsin. This publication was also made possible in part by the people of Minnesota through a grant funded by an appropriation to the Minnesota Historical Society from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Any views, findings, opinions, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this publication are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent those of the State of Minnesota, the Minnesota Historical Society, or the Minnesota Historic Resources Advisory Committee. Anaya Chopta Pecha Wopira Thank you for listening.